Coach Blauer, thank you so much for your time. Um, really excited to chat with you. You know, I've heard your name from from uh, Coach Connolly, and really excited about what you do. So, for the listeners at home, will you tell us a little bit about your background, your motivation, and kind of where you are currently? Uh, sure, man. Hey, it's great to be on the show. I appreciate I appreciate you reaching out. And uh, ironically, I was uh, just reading Fifty Nine Lessons, so I got a <laughs> shout out to uh, to Fergus there. Uh, and and if, if you haven't read the book, you guys should get it. Anybody who's interested in, in, in coaching and mindset and, mm-hmm. and that journey. And as I was reading his book, it's funny you asked that question. As I was reading that book, uh, it, you know, it, it triggers me. I'm 58 years old now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's uh, that blows my mind to even say that because, <laughs> you know, when I was – how old are you? I'm 26. Okay. You know, so, you know, when I was, when I was 26, mm-hmm. uh, I was like, wow, wonder like that guy's 30 yeah. <laughs> like, wow, that guy's 40 holy shit what yeah. am I going to be doing like, and so it blows my mind that I'm this old and I'm still doing what I love mm. and and it's getting deeper yeah. and it's getting it's getting more refined and more intense so you never stop you never stop learning mm-hmm. and you never stop living and um, but I I grew up so what I do is my main business is I train law enforcement and military mm-hmm. in close quarter combatives. Okay. My big picture umbrella is I teach good people how to protect themselves. Mm. One of the things that I realized along the way, uh-huh. and, and my articulation of this now is a lot more refined, but I realized that nobody does anything mm-hmm. with intensity and commitment if they can't manage their fear, mm. their performance anxiety. Yeah. You know, so nowhere is that more important than in sports, mm-hmm. but performance anxiety if we if we extrapolate is uh how it's this idea of like am I going to succeed? Am yeah. I going to how you know, you know, I hope I don't suck at this. Mm-hmm. And I and I and I so that could be public speaking. It could be starting a business. If in the back of your head you're carrying around the weight, the stress, the anxiety of how are you going to do, you can't flow. You can't get in the zone the way, yeah. the way you need to. Um, I found that nowhere is that more pristine and perfect than in the uh, scenario of violence mm-hmm. because, you know, like even in a combat sport, you can tap. And you see some fighters pass out, like yeah. someone gets a, a, a rear strangle on him, and the guy's fighting, fighting, he passes out, and the ref steps in and goes, he's out. Mm-hmm. And then some people tap out right away. You know, what's what's that mindset uh, difference there? So uh, w- w- when I was growing up, I was fascinated with fear. Mm-hmm. But I'm talking like six years old, seven yeah, years yeah. old, years old. And I couldn't articulate it. Yeah. I didn't articulate it, but I was... I was always afraid of stuff. I was afraid when I was wrestling. I was afraid when I was doing gymnastics. I was afraid when I was skiing. I was afraid when my mother would come home. Mm-hmm. And I, li- <laughs> you know, I lived with all this fear. And and so it doesn't surprise me the serendipity yeah. of it all. It doesn't surprise me that uh, I teach a program called No Fear, yeah. spelled K N O W. You know, and um, but that's kind of like the Reader's Digest is. Uh, uh, I I somehow intuitively knew that I needed to understand violence uh-huh. and how to protect myself, and that gave me an insight into the psychology of fear that people weren't talking about. Yeah, and that's what I do now. That's my that's my my living. And I've worked with, you know, from tier one military operators uh-huh. to to athletes, you yeah. know, fighters, CrossFitters, and you know whatever. Interesting. Okay, so you've been referred to as a as a fear coach, right? Is that correct? It's kind of scary. Um, <laughs> that's a, that was a joke, guys. Uh, um, I guess I, I'm probably called a bunch of things. Okay. I, I'd, I'd never really heard that till you said that. Okay. Uh, you know, is that is that what Coach Connolly? Yeah. Of, like, alluded. Yeah, that's that's kind of neat. Uh, um, uh, maybe I gotta I gotta look into that. Maybe my business will work double <laughs> if I. Uh, um, that's I mean I I I, I specialize in. Like when someone comes to me and they go, uh, I'm having trouble with my snatch. I'm yeah. having trouble with my deadlift. Uh-huh. You know, I don't coach them on movement mechanics. I okay. coach them on mindset mechanics. Yeah. Right. And I go, well, you know, because I know that at the end of the day, it, it it's it's you know, the our relationship with fear mm-hmm. changes everything we do. Interesting. Yeah. 
Most definitely. I know I agree. So will you kind of touch on your on your system and, and your approach, right? So you kind of have on your website, you have three different prongs of athletes, right? You have law enforcement and military, um, like self-defense and martial arts, and then uh, just kind of general athlete, right? So will you kind of right. touch on your approach to each of these and, and how it differs among each of the three groups? Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, what's fascinating is it doesn't differ. Mm. That's the that's the magic of this. I could okay. have, you know, a, like a like a SWAT commander in my class yeah. and a, an overweight female. Yeah. And and I'm going to explain to them that each one of you has a scenario, mm. and inside that scenario, you've got like this combination of instincts, intuition, and intelligence, the yeah. wealth of experience, your mindset, mm-hmm. and you'll look at it, and and. You know, so if you've done obstacle races mm-hmm. and, and and then someone says, Hey, let's do a Spartan race, mm-hmm. you're like, Wow, cool, right? And then and then uh, uh, you know, you you go to recruit someone else and they have trouble, you know, they fell when they were eight years old tr- yeah. climbing over a fence and, mm-hmm. and broke their elbow. Okay. Right? That person has PTSD climbing over a fence. How are they going to do in the Spartan race? Yeah. Right? So if they haven't overcome their fear of that. And mm-hmm. so this is you know, a real simplified example of the, 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 like the neuroscience behind how we do things is consistent amongst the human species. Yeah. And so one of the things I always talk about is that physiology, physics, and psychology mm-hmm. is, is, are, the, are the ingredients for success in anything. Yeah, it, that requires some sort of like movement, right? Mm-hmm. So when I when I really started to refine my approach to self defense, it was specifically understanding physiology, mm-hmm. understanding the kinesiology that is influenced by the physiology, and then mm-hmm. understanding the psychology of all of that. So that's a metacognition, like a metacognitive understanding of us as a human weapon system. Yeah. So if I was teaching a cop or somebody in the military they were stress inoculated to a different level, right? Mm, so by yeah, the time they came to my course, you know, they'd already run an obstacle race. They'd already done some force on force training. Yeah. Whether, it was, whether it was desirable or less desirable, they were like, okay, let's go. We're going to move towards the danger. Yeah. Um, the martial artists mm-hmm. had a different idea of how to handle confrontations, but they had done some training. Yeah. And then the third group, like the like general public, general fitness, uh, f- functional fitness community and all of that. Uh, what was interesting about about that group is, um, uh, depending on where they came from, mm-hmm. they had the same psychological gumption yeah. to try the exercises. Okay. Right. So if if, if uh, uh, and this is interesting. This is an interesting like social experiment mm-hmm. that you know. And I'm not making fun of yoga here, but if I took somebody who was like their focus was yoga and they're yeah. in really good shape from yoga, uh-huh. and then I and then I took somebody who, uh, let's say, was a CrossFitter, uh-huh. right? The intensity of the CrossFit regime mm-hmm. uh, creates an adaptation psychologically that you're not going to get in hot yoga. So what was interesting is the more intense your sport, the yeah. greater adaptation. The psychological side has okay. So you, you 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 start to through osmosis even yeah. adapt. Now what's interesting is like I've had competitive athletes uh-huh. uh, from fighters to you know uh, you know the functional fitness community yeah. to you know the weightlifting and and at some point there's a person a movement uh, a, 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 a number on the weight that inspires fear. Mm. So how do you define det- intensity, right? So like say team sports versus individual or like weightlifting sport or, you know, that kind of thing. How do you define intensity of the sport in terms of mental adaptation? What do you mean by define the intensity? So you I said that a couple of ways. Okay. So you, you said um, the intensity of the sport will right. create right. adaptation uh, mentally, right? The cognitively. Right. So what's so, like that so- spectrum? Yeah. So, uh, well, what's interesting is it's different for each person, and it's, okay. you know, I was, I was just actually, uh, uh, you know, in in Coach Connolly's book where he's uh-huh. talking about, uh, like, like right in the beginning that like like that this this you know, uh, the language he used here from one of the coaches, compassionately ruthless. Okay. Right? Do you want to win or do you want to not win? Because mm. it's not like a like a you can't win. Rec- it's not like a recreational idea. I yeah. have to win, right? Uh-huh. And and it's a very intense thought, you know. And it resonated like like in the eighties, 
I said to a, a group of students in a seminar, I said, if you mean to do it, make it mean. Mm, yeah. Because they were they were striking things apologetically. Yeah. It was like they were hitting something going, is this okay, coach? I'm yeah. like, fucking smash the bag, man. Like, yeah. nail that. Right? And I, I don't know if I can swear on your show too late. I just uh, yeah, but <laughs> go okay. for it. Yeah. Um, right? And so it's, it's, you know, it's like you can't tackle someone apologetically. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, and I'm not talking about trying to hurt somebody or mm -hmm. injure somebody in, in that context. It's yeah. just, it's unique to every person. So uh -huh. I could have a golfer yeah. who, who like, that's not a violent sport, Yeah. but yeah, I remember, I remember taking up golf at, uh, many years ago and, uh -huh. it, you know, it wasn't natural for my body type yeah. and internally rotated from fighting and, yeah. you know, like, uh, you know, years of, of combatants, but for some reason it fascinated me and I went to go play in Texas. Uh -huh. Uh, one day and they just had this big rainstorm and I was playing at this this well-known new club called the quarry okay. It was a golf course built inside of a quarry. Yeah, and I go up to and I grew up in Canada and I go up to the uh, the uh, Starter yeah, and I go hey, you know, can I just get in like nine holes at the end of the day? I just arrived but brought my clubs. Yeah, he says yeah, just just be careful of the water moccasins mm. And I was like what? <laughs> yeah, that's not what and you want to hear. He goes he goes he goes, yeah, yeah, they're all over the course now because of the rain. <laughs> wow. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm like, you're joking, right? He goes, no. And he goes, and he goes, my thing. It was the scariest nine holes of golf <laughs> I ever played. It was horrible. I didn't even count score because yeah. I lost so many balls. I'll look. Yeah. And what's my point is here I am, a fear management consultant, yeah. a fear management coach. Uh -huh. I was, uh, I was mediocre at golf, but I'm a good athlete. I was picking up stuff. I could not concentrate on anything because I didn't want to die on the golf course. Yeah. Because ninety water moccasins decided to eat, me, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and here's the amazing thing: is is I, I uh, you know, there was already golfers out there, so they like they weren't just hanging out, but they've yeah. been reported back. Hey, we saw one here. We saw one here. I don't even remember if I saw one, but they were all in my mind. Right. Yeah. So remember, what Lombardi said, "Hey, you know, You're, footsteps, right? Mm -hmm. Footsteps." You're inoculated. Um, so, so here's the thing. So to answer your question, is like, hey, like how I interpret it is, does a certain sport create better adaptation yeah. for managing fear? That's how I okay. interpreted it. And I go, well, um, and that's why I said earlier, if we circle back to what I said, uh -huh. that everybody has a movement or a person, meaning opponent, mm -hmm. or uh, a weight where I go, Hey, that's a beautiful uh, snatch. You know, what's your weight on that? And the person goes, Oh, you know, uh, 200. I go, well, what's your, what's your PR? And they go 200. I go, well, let's do, let's go 202. Yeah. Well, I'm not ready for that. Like suddenly their form changes mm. because they just went, I can't do that in their mind Yeah. where, you know, when Tyson was, was ruling boxing yeah. back in the day, like you saw people at, at press conferences and, and weigh-ins going, I'm going to kick your ass. Yeah. And then when they would walk to the ring mm -hmm. and see him there in his black shorts with no with no socks and yeah. shoes, well, that was a different person. And yeah. so it didn't matter that you were – that's what I'm saying is like you're world class. You've been fighting for 10 years and then uh -huh. suddenly go, okay, I'm not so sure about today. Yeah. That's – that's to me, that's what fascinated me mm. is how do we get people to understand – and what I did is I separated the physiology of fear with the psychology of fear. And my okay. focus was only that I can't change what I'm feeling. I can only influence what I'm thinking. Hmm. Okay. Well, you kind of pull on that thread a little bit. And, and how do you work on, say, the psychology of fear? When you So someone comes in the door, right, or a group comes through the door, they, they contact you, right? So what's that look like in term, from a general perspective in terms of what you do with them? Well, one is I created a map, mm -hmm. uh, which we call the cycle of behavior or the, the, the neural circuitry of fear. Okay. It's just a simple like little st like strip map. Yeah. You're here and you need to get here and these are your obstacles. Mm -hmm. And those obstacles look like, and I, you know, after 9-11, uh, FedEx hired me to uh, create a program for yeah. all their pilots. Okay. And um, the, uh, um, you know, a, a 
lot of the stuff there, you know, uh, you know, like flying airplanes is understanding circuits and electrical and all of that. And I'm not good with any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting was um, when when I showed them this flow chart that said, hey, this is your scenario. You need to be motivated. You need to be inspired. You need to be thinking here. These are the, the, the you know, uh, there's, a, there's another box called your fear loop. And like, so I had all these things and I'll go through them in a minute. Yeah. But, but the pilots that are training said, Hey, this looks like an electrical flow chart. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I never even thought about that. Cause I don't know much about that. And yeah. it became this metaphor for the neural circuitry of fear. Meaning if you blow a fuse, uh -huh. a metaphoric fuse anywhere, mm -hmm. right? So you can be in the, your locker room going, we're going to crush them today. We're going to yeah. do that. And then you walk out and, and something changed in the ritual. You mm -hmm. go, I don't, oh man, I forgot my lucky socks. Uh, like something just gets in your head. Yeah. It changes that flow. I'm fascinated with that. Where I said to athletes, you know, your socks have nothing to do with your skill, yeah. right? Yeah. You know? Yeah, and exactly. Hear that. And I'm like, that lucky rabbit, it's dead. So <laughs> it's, it's not the lucky rabbit, right? it, yeah, it's the opposite of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you, you know, it's funny, but all, I, I've noticed not all, but most athletes mm -hmm. are super, superstitious. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I am too. I'm an athlete. Yeah. But I'm, I'm superstitious, but I make fun of myself. Mm. I'll go, well, maybe this will happen because yesterday when I touched my phone like this, you know, that good <laughs> thing happened. It's yeah. stupid shit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's fun to play with. But no, definitely. So, so what I do with the fear mm. is I, I present it. First of all, I, I, I help people understand the difference between the physiology and the psychology. Okay. So the physiology is if I say, hey, man, um, no, I mean, and I love, I love telling stories because you remember a story rather yeah. than saying, oh, yes, the myelinization <laughs> that occurred during this neurotransmitter activation. Like, yeah. like you're like, what? Cool. It just doesn't stick, um, yeah. Right, doesn't stick. So I do a lot of uh, speaking around the world, and I, okay. got, I got called to go talk uh, for the Airline Pilots Association uh -huh. um, and, and do something on air rage and people losing their shit on the airlines <laughs> and fights and the violence there and all that stuff. Okay. Right? So, so I get, I get called and I go in and, uh, you know, my talk is supposed to be an hour and okay. then it became 45 minutes and then yeah. they said, you got 30 minutes and mm. I'm like, okay, okay. Now it's getting shorter. Yeah. 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 You're going to have to cram some stuff in. And, and, yeah. And then, and then they, and I had originally been told it'll be like just a bunch of reporters because an incident had happened and they wanted to bring in a subject matter expert. Yeah. Um, so I go out and I peek up behind the curtain and one of the speakers and there's like hundreds of people there. Yeah. And I'm like, like, you didn't tell me that you, like, when you said a bunch of reporters, yeah, like that was, but you left out the part where there were 500 people wow. in a conference. Um, and then, and then it was like, oh, it, I thought you'd be cool with that. I am cool about it, but it's like, it's a, a, a stimulus that's getting introduced too quickly. Yeah. yeah. You no. Know? And, and so, uh, you know, and that was the foundation of my, my combative system where, I noticed during drills that if a stimulus gets introduced too quickly, your reactive self, your mm -hmm. reptilian brain, the limbic system, the amygdala, kind of re reacted to that before your cognitive self could catch up. Mm -hmm. So if if uh, you know someone goes, look over here, you know you move. There's a startle flinch. Um, anyways, so tying this to the story with this public speaking, which is incidentally. Most of, for most people, the number one fear in the world, mm. not getting eaten by a shark, yeah. not getting, you know, dragged to a secondary crime scene. It's public speaking. Mm. Right. And so, and that's why through self-defense, I'm able to empower on so many different levels because I go, you know what the scariest thing would be sudden violence directed to you or your family. Yeah. That would be the scariest thing. None of the other shit is as scary. Mm. Um, so the, the, at, at this this uh, conference, they then put like a like an earpiece on, and they go, "Hey, you know, by the way, this is also being broadcast live. You know, you've got CNN, you've got Fox." And well, hold on a second, <laughs> I thought it was going to be a small thing, and now I've got like there's live news. Yeah, and big difference. And I'm being, and I'm being mic'd, and I'm up in like 15 minutes, and you cut my my time to talk, so I don't yeah. have that flow. What am I going to say first now? And uh, I remember calling my wife. She said, like, I, I said, I'm so nervous. I completely forgot everything I know and everything I'm going to say. And she says, just start talking. You'll be fine. I go, no, you don't understand. Like, I'm like, I'm freaking sweating. I don't know. And um, she said, 
just start talking, you'll be fine. Uh -huh. And I was so scared, man. I went up there and I started talking and I called her up after. I go, that was my best talk ever. And she goes, yeah, like, you know, but here's the thing is I let what I was able to do is remind myself about the difference between the psychology of fear and the biology of fear mm. or the physiology of fear. Okay. And that's the biggest thing for anyone listening to this is you can have your best performance ever while your palms are sweaty, your heart is pounding, you know, you got butterflies in your stomach. And yeah. what we don't do, what we don't tell people is that some of the sensations that we feel when, when our body has arousal, the fear spike and all of that, um, like that is going to be there or it's not going to be there regardless. Yeah. Like we can't control that. Like if I said to you, anybody who's butterflies in their stomach is, isn't ready for competition. Mm -hmm. Right. That'd be a ridiculous statement. Nobody would be communicating. Right. Yeah. So, so like, and, 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 th and that's why like my big thing when I, when I came up with the, uh, with the program, no fear, spelling it K N O W, mm -hmm. it was I talk about, you know, the no fear slogan, yeah, and no fear, right? Where I grew up with that company, yeah, and it's a great slogan and it's a great message, but it doesn't exist, and that if we, as as athletes and coaches, have this erroneous notion that there's a state of no fear, mm -hmm. that if we can get to a place of no fear, yeah. Uh, what we're doing, I really believe, is 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 setting up our athletes for potential failure. Because as soon as they have a like a little fear spike or a little self doubt, um, that that changes their mindset. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I agree. And then, can we touch a little bit also on how the biology and physiology um, kind of affect each other, and how uh, working on one can affect the other? Yeah, so, you know, uh, in 1993, I wrote an article called The Theory of Presumed Compliance, and it was okay. written for the cop community, yeah. law enforcement community, and basically self-defense. But, but I, 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 I had this intuitive thought that how we feel affects how we think, and how we think affects how we feel, and yeah. both influence how we move. Yeah. So if you're walking up to the ring going, man, I hope I don't get hit by this guy because <laughs> he'll knock me out. I can't take it. Like, if that's... If that's the undercurrent of your subconscious or conscious thought, uh -huh. then how's that going to influence your movement? Yeah. Um, if you think, you know, there's no chance that the team can win uh -huh. and now you're in a team sport and you're going like, Hey, these guys are undefeated. Uh, you know, uh, you know, last week they injured three of the players on the, on the other team because of how big these guys are. Uh -huh. uh, and you're thinking, I hope I don't freaking get injured. That'll yeah. put me out for the season with like all these things. You know, like all of that. So, so, you know, using layperson rather than like some pedantic esoteric language. <laughs> yeah. Um, the 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 how you feel influences how you think, and how you think influences how you feel, and both influence how you move. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, I've been really studying deliberate breathing a lot. Okay. More in the last couple like years. Like meditation type. Really? Meditation and all, like whether it's it's uh, my buddy Brian McKenzie from uh -huh. Heart of Breath, uh, you know, uh, uh, Wim Hof, uh, Belisa Vranich from Breathe. I mean, there's there's so much like convergent evolution right now yeah. on breathing technologies. But the reality is, you know, we last X amount of days with no food, X amount with no water, but seconds without air or oxygen. Yeah. Um, and we could be having this really cool conversation, but if all the air suddenly got sucked out of your room you wouldn't yeah. give a shit what my next sentence was about yeah. right and so here is a martial artist who's been in the in the ring doing scenarios training for decades i assume i understood breathing yeah um and i did and 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 discovered it serendipitously uh you, you know through a, an injury that i had last year that that started a, 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 an injury i had to uh, my neck that impacted my facial and trigeminal nerve mm. and my nervous system uh, got so messed up that it started triggering like, like random anxiety Wow! Uh, that, that, um, y you know, like I'd be sitting there and all of a sudden like, okay, I got to move. I got to get to the room. I like, I can have a panic attack. Yeah. Didn't know where the hell it was coming from, yeah. but it was because my, my nervous system was trying to like regroom and rebuild itself yeah. from the injury. And, uh, it was insane. 
and uh, my buddy Brian McKenzie, we were talking and he had me do some breathing protocols. And like within three days, I was able to regulate my state and it blew my mind because I had always taken breathing for, for granted. Yeah. It's kind of Just, something that happens, right? Yeah. And so my, my aerobic capacity was always pretty intense uh -huh. from all the training. That's that yeah. adaptation from always doing, you know, that intense sparring and those fighting scenarios and stuff like that. Mm. But when I was taken out of my arena that I was, I was comfortable in, yeah. um, it, it changed everything. So if I tie this back to your question about physiology and psychology and the connection between fear and, 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 and so on and so forth yeah. is I've now adapted and injected and, and, and this is a big thing for you coaches and athletes listening to this is that I've been in, you know, like the UFC locker room before a fight and seeing like different fighters. One guy's like listening to headphones and he's like in some, like you could see him in some meditative trance. Yeah. There's somebody else listening to Metallica pacing the room. There's another guy punching himself in the face, you know, getting ready. Yeah. Like everyone has a pre-fight ritual. Okay. And so this is a big thing that, that I'm, when, you know, when I coach coaches and train trainers, I tell them it's not a one size fits all. Yeah. And that's, that's a big mistake in the world is like, you know, uh, you need to, it's like a parent with three kids. You can, you, you, each, each kid needs yeah. to be mentored di differently. Exactly. So you, you need to have a bunch of tools there, but you want to remember that regardless, you know, there's going to be an emotional system uh -huh. of that human being. There's going to be a physiological system. There's going to be a psychological system. You need to understand enough about how they communicate to each other. Yeah. Um, and all of it, you can read body language is 60% of communication. All of that you can read in body language and breathing. Mm. When I'd be in the ring with somebody, I knew, I knew intuitively from how they were breathing, how I could move on them or when I should move on them. Uh, right. Okay, if yeah. I saw their mouth open a little bit, yeah. I start mouth breathing instead uh -huh. of nose breathing. I knew they were tired. Yeah. If I was in a, if I was in a clinch, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm in there, I'd be, I didn't realize it at the time uh -huh. years ago, but my auditory sense was listening for that, you yeah. know, that sort of like, you know, uh, kind of, uh, like labor breathing, fatigue breathing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when the body shot would happen yeah. or the uppercut, you know, yeah. very, very subtle, but, um, important stuff because if you develop the self-awareness to apply this principle to you, yeah you ch you change your capacity. Yeah. No, I agree. So, you you do a lot with self-defense obviously, right? So, what is a barrier to entry in self-defense? Like, why don't more people take it seriously? Why don't more people know how to defend themselves? Dude, if we figure that out, you and I just retired. Hey, right? Come on now. Listen, listen uh here's the thing as I have said as recently as like a month ago. Mm -hmm. So, remember, I've been teaching now for 43 years. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, there are millions of people studying martial arts, mm -hmm. but only thousands of people studying self-defense. Yeah. You know, most people, it's, it's, it's like most people don't, you know, work on their will and their life insurance because we don't want to accept the fact that, Hey, you know, there's a timeline to this whole thing called life. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, a lot of, you know, younger people think they're invincible. Yeah. Most people to really study self-defense need to accept the fact that bad shit happens. Yeah. You know, I've got a maxim in my system that violence doesn't really care, you know, whether you're a pacifist or not. Violence mm. doesn't care what style you study. Violence yeah. doesn't care if you're a Republican or liberal. Yeah. Violence just doesn't care. And so I'm not cavalier about it, but most people live in a bubble. They think the cavalry are Russian. We've yeah. outsourced our safety mm -hmm. for many years, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I was a, a line um, that, that a host on another uh, podcast yeah. shared where I explained to him, like, we just expect the police are going to fix it, that the cavalry yeah. is going to rush in, yeah. that, you know, um, and, the, and the reality is if something's happening to you, you don't even have time to dial 911. That's exactly. how fast it happens. Yeah. And so, you know, to answer your question philosophically, I have no idea uh, why people don't take it more seriously. I've been teaching now for 40 plus years professionally. Uh -huh. And and if I bump into 10 people and talk to them about what I do, yeah. you know, one of them might show up to a course. Yeah. Wow. 
That's where in the conversation they're like, wow, I always want to learn how to defend myself. Yeah. You know, like if you ask somebody there, you know, would you like to know how to defend yourself? They would say, yeah. Yeah. They go, well, come to this class on Saturday. Come to this <laughs> workshop. Uh-huh. They don't show. Yeah. You know. That's um, interesting. It's, it's, it's a fascinating thing to me. And I started off the answer by saying, like, as recently as a month ago, I said to somebody on a, I think it was maybe Facebook Live or some group thing or a webinar, I said, why is it that I care more about your safety than you do? Mm. So here's a reframe, too, is a lot of people maybe think, well, you know, but the real answer is what we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. Yeah. Fear. Yeah. The real answer is fear. It, they're afraid they're not going to be good at it. They're afraid they're going to attract more violence. Mm. They're afraid that uh, uh, the, the, that it's going to hurt. They're afraid, uh, whatever it is, when you peel that proverbial onion, uh-huh. why why wouldn't you, you know, if, if, if I said to you, you know, you got food, you got water, you got breathing, you know, um, would you... You know where are you going to put your focus on? Like people, are like, no, do I want that? Give me that protein bar. Yeah. Right. You know. Well, no, you should have taken the bottle of water. But yeah. actually, you need to know to control your breathing because if bad mm-hmm. shit starts to happen and The Walking yeah. Dead happens and all that, if you hyperventilate and pass out, yeah. the zombie's just going to eat you. Exactly. You need to. If you're hiding and you're hiding in the closet and there's like an active shooter or a zombie and you're in the closet going. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah we know where you are yeah and so it's and i look at i go you know i think and it go of course this is my bias but the ability to protect yourself or a loved one mm-hmm. in my opinion is the most important skill you could possess yeah because in that study you learn about breathing you learn about fear management and you learn to be able to look in a proverbial mirror and say you know what if I have to be the courageous bystander, uh-huh. or if I need to protect myself, my family, I'm going to go for it. And it's not about technique; it's about mindset. Mm. Yeah, that's the epiphany. That's yeah. the epiphany, folks. Okay. And with that, right? So, we touched some more on on um, more of your system, right? So, I read on your on your website, right? You kind of take advantage of that initial like flinch reflex. Um, right. So, can you touch a little bit more on that? Yeah. So. Um, you know, and it's 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 interesting. The uh, the startle flinch response yeah. is like part of our survival system. Yeah, it's been around. Uh, it, it's been around for as long as there's been people on uh-huh. the planet Earth. Yeah, and so, you know, in certain in some of the talks, my lead off slide will be something like behaviorally inspired, genetically wired. Okay, and people are like, well, what the hell's this? Well, the system I'm going to talk about has been inspired by behavior observing okay. human nature yeah and the it's built on the science of psychology the science of movement the okay. science of physiology yeah and and i'm proud of that i'm really proud of that because i'm not teaching people complex motor skills you mm. know i talk about the litmus test the litmus test is cctv okay uh, smartphone capture like when you watch fights on the news like mm. i'm talking about a violent encounter not like two douchebags <laughs> you know arguing over a uh, parking yeah. uh, spot um you don't see finessed martial arts yeah. you don't see technique even in trained people mm. if you watch uh, uh someone in the military or 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 a cop you know somebody who's trained in some basic defensive tactics uh-huh. but there's real violence being directed at them yeah. you don't see the guy in a front stance doing a clean kick or yeah. some jiu-jitsu move or whatever you just never do yeah and so i looked at that decades ago and i said huh you know that's the evidence mm-hmm. our training should be based on evidence yeah right Agreed. if i watch a football team play uh-huh. and i've got film of them training the yeah. training and the play the actual game look very similar regardless yeah. of who wins or loses yeah they figured out how to reverse engineer practice so that it mirrors the game. Uh But when you watch martial artists practice self-defense, it does not mirror the game. Mm. That was my big thing in 1980 when a student of mine got his ass kicked and I took it to heart really personally. And it was like, almost like I remember saying like the God of self-defense hit me with a lightning bolt. Yeah. That was my big life changing moment when he described what happened to in his confrontation. Yeah. I was like, holy shit, I completely taught this guy wrong. Yeah. Not, I wasn't malicious and and for the most part, self defense instructors and martial arts aren't malicious. Yeah. We don't know what we don't know. Mm. 
And so that began my exploration of, uh, of, and this is 1980, there was no reality-based self-defense. There yeah. was no, you know, not, like none of that stuff. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, I don't know if this is obnoxious to say, pioneered this whole approach mm -hmm. to, to, uh, looking at scenarios and then reverse engineering a scenario based on something you saw in the news, mm. um, as opposed to, cause, cause the, the way I learned how to defend myself was sparring. Yeah. Right. You yeah. go, you learn how to punch, you learn to kick, you learn to block, you learn how to counter this. Mm -hmm. And one of them, I'm working on a couple of books right now, but one of them is, is understanding, is bringing modern neuroscience explanation of neurotransmitters, neuromyelinization, you know, how we, how, how the brain actually learns yeah. and, and, and showing how the conventional SOP of learning uh -huh. is actually training us to be reactive and therefore slower, mm. uh, because of the way we sequence our, our, our training. Yeah. So, um, interesting. Yeah. But, but the, the startle flinch experience, uh, uh, came out of a, uh, an improvisational drill that I had hallucinated one night and I went into the gym the next day and I grabbed one of my students who was yeah. a really good boxer. And I said, Hey, Warren, put on a pair of boxing gloves. I'm going to put on a mouth guard. Yeah. I said, I want you to like sucker punch me. Yeah. I'm going to film this, but how are you going to sucker punch me is you're going to start a conversation with me. Yeah. And, and then in the middle of the conversation just hit me Yeah. and he's like, what, what coach? <laughs> Quite the goes, instruction. What are yeah. you going to do? I said, yeah. I just want to film it. Yeah. He said, and this is way before wax saw and wax off, right? Karate kid shit. Yeah. I said, I, like, I, I want to know how close is too close. Yeah. Right. Cause we need time and space. Yeah. Uh, to, to, oh, here's a kick coming in. Yeah. Oh, look, I'm reading this play. I got to intercept it. Right. We need time and space to see shit. Yeah. Um, and I said, you know, here's what we think about this, man. I don't know if you've done martial arts, but a but little bit. The, yeah. The, if I'm trying to practice a block, yeah. I say to my partner, throw that punch. I'll yeah. slow that down a little bit. Okay. A little bit faster. If I'm trying to get out of a headlock, I go, okay, give me a headlock. Oh, that's yeah. too tight. Wait a minute. I wasn't ready. Yeah. Okay. Put me on the headlock again. <laughs> we don't realize this, but we're choreographing and we're coaching yeah the attacker to move a certain way so that we can do a certain counter yeah and so if you understand like neurons and myelinization mm, there's yeah. no such thing as muscle memory we're training our brain to look for a certain stimulus so that we can react with our own stimulus yeah you know or response um and and so when you do ten thousand reps of how to get out of a headlock uh -huh. you don't realize in that moment that you've done ten thousand and one reps of letting somebody attack you. Yeah, that's okay. Never thought about right? it. Right? Yeah. No one thinks about that. Yeah. That's, that's uh, you know, and I can see that light bulb in your freaking head there <laughs> when you're in holy shit, right? Yeah. So, in, now, that makes sense in jiu-jitsu, and that makes sense in boxing, yeah. right? I can't throw an over overhand right over the guy's jab yeah. if there's no jab. Mm -hmm. I can't practice countering, right? Yeah. But... If I don't have the jab, then all I'm doing is throwing a right, and people say, don't lead with a right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so in context, when there's a sequential relationship, when there's a dance, but that's different in violence. Yeah. And so in violence, I'm at the ATM machine. In violence, I'm walking with my kids. Yeah. In violence, I'm asleep in bed, and all of a sudden, you know, I hear the door get kicked in. Yeah. I don't have the luxury of knowing, oh, it's Wednesday night, it's sparring night, I'll yeah. show up early and, and, and warm up. Yeah. And that's the thing. And so if we come back to, you know, when I was teaching this kid in 1980, how I trained him to prepare for this bully confrontation at school uh -huh. was by teaching him some Taekwondo and some boxing and some wrestling. Yeah. And this is like 13 years before the first UFC. Yeah. Right. That was my foundation. I was already doing some sort of mixed martial art uh, approach okay. and scenario. But what I was teaching him was when he does this, you do that. Yeah. And what I was actually doing was training his brain to move second. Mm. Interesting. Right? Yeah. And, and so, you know, how do we teach people to move first? We've got to change the panorama of violence from this myopic linear. Yeah. When he gets headlock, I know how to get out to why is that guy walking here? Yeah. I don't like his body language. Mm -hmm. What's he got in his hand? Like starting to see shit yeah. from there 
And so we created a, a protocol called the three D's detect, diffuse, defend, detect and avoid. Okay. Defuse like D E F U S E defuse, take out the fuse, de defuse and deescalate. Uh -huh. Like what are my, my, my verbal skills. Mm -hmm. And then if push comes to shove, how to defend myself. Yeah. And then, and this, you know, took years and years to cultivate. Yeah. Then I created a movement pattern uh -huh. of interconnected movements called primal protective tactical. That if okay. the stimulus, if the person attacked me too quickly, my response would be primal, which would be close to what my body's physiology wanted to do prior to any training. Okay. If I had some pre-contact cue, it might be protective, which is characterized by like a pushing away. Yeah. Uh, gesture and if it was tactical like oh shit he really telegraphed there'd be a micro flinch and i could move on it but the movement which became the spear which yeah. was acronym and the acronym for spontaneous protection yeah. enabling accelerated response explaining the brain function uh -huh. and how the startle flinch actually influenced how my body moved yeah and then the psychological adaptation was how fast can i get my 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 executive function my my frontal cortex um to catch up to what my reptilian brain was going to do anyhow. Mm. That was the exciting neuroscience connection. Yeah. Um, and so what was neat about this is, is this was, this was uniform across all human species. Okay. Like it didn't matter if it did gender, it didn't matter age. Yeah. I could, I could walk up to a seven year old and go, duh, and yeah. scream. It would go, whoa, you scared the shit out of me. <laughs> and I could walk up to an adult and go, ah, and yeah. they go, ah, and they would start off flinch the same way. It didn't yeah. matter uh -huh. if they're male or female or, or young or old. Yeah. So we're teaching people how to weaponize the start of flinch, get their psychological system to catch up to the danger, and and at least give them a fighting chance. So your start of flinch is almost like an organic airbag yeah. car that just deploys when, boom, something gets hit. Yeah. And that that hit could be auditory, visual, or tactile. Interesting. So how, how have we kind of messed up our... So let's say, let's put it in present day context, right? And you, you talked about kind of the, how you formed all the system. But let's put it in like day to day, right? So a lot of people, they're in office jobs. And so, you know, their stress response is all kind of mixed up because now we're getting stressed out by, by little things like emails and, and, uh, right. you know, your boss, that kind of thing. So how have we affected our stress response and our fear response just by, has it been blunted? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, no, I think it's been agitated. Okay. So we're more reactive, uh -huh. but, but I, it's, it's interesting. Like, um, you know, they've done these, courageous bystander social experiments where they pretend to kidnap a kid or attack yeah. somebody and you just watch people walking around on their phone looking yeah. and they're you know so in that sense um something horrible has gone wrong with society where we don't have the courageous bystanders and the heroes people don't want to get involved they're yeah. too busy they don't want to get sued yeah like you know we're in a bad era you know like as, as far as that goes where back in the day you know, if, if we had a, like a, like a small village on the side of a mountain or uh -huh. there were, you know, we were just building walls around our city and some wild animal or some marauders came in, yeah. you know, everyone grabbed a weapon and, and, and tried to protect each other because yeah. we were all we had. Yeah. And, and, um, so that's been, that's been dampened. And, and it's one of the things I talk about is like, how do we reawaken our survival instincts? I really believe they're just dormant. They've just mm. been domesticated right yeah. just you know just like animals right uh -huh. but there was a time not too long ago where if we went back in time you and i weren't talking on the internet mm. and you weren't in a cool office chair yeah. and i wasn't at my stand-up desk yeah you know we were now you know sitting outside going i can't believe it rained now we can't make a fire because yeah. the kindling's all wet uh -huh. i hope we don't starve to death uh -huh. oh shit like there's a rabbit over there how are we going to catch it like yeah. we like we figured out how to hunt and survive yeah and, and um, so the, you know, it's an interesting question. I don't have a good answer for it other than um, I've, I, I really believe that, um, you know, the phone, the smartphone has made us stupid Yeah. Uh, in the sense of as amazing as it is, you remember when that knockout game yeah. was, was going around? Uh -huh. I mean, it's just people with zero situational awareness. Yeah, they're just blindsided, completely, you know, right. no idea. And, yeah, and so situational awareness isn't like being paranoid and walking around like they say, head on a swivel, head on a swivel. Yeah. I like to get a little bit more philosophical when talking about situational awareness by um, by telling people that um, your self-awareness yeah. 
governs your situational awareness. Okay. It's the governor switch. So if you don't know that you're an asshole mm. or that you have a drinking problem or that every Friday night you go out and have like three shots of tequila and go to that same shitty bar <laughs> and then on Monday you go, I can't believe, you know, I got into a fight Friday night again. You know, yeah. what's with people? Yeah. And I go, well, <laughs> like, what's the routine here? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so not to be, you know, tongue in cheek or make, make fun of this, but self-awareness really kind of influences your situational awareness. Mm, okay. Right? Yeah. And, and, and in interviewing thousands or hundreds and thousands of, of, I don't know if it's been thousands, but hundreds of victims of violence over the years, um, it's amazing to me how most of them, oh, remember what I said earlier, I talked about the three Ds, detect, yeah. defuse, defend. Most of them only st- were aware of the violence when the violence started. Mm. None yeah. of them had, you know, and if I like this idea that this guy was following him for, t- for two blocks yeah. was, you know, and suddenly he grabbed me yeah. like, and I go like he beamed down from a, like a, a starship, yeah. like enterprise. Like yeah. how did he, what do you mean? He just grabbed you. Yeah. Weren't you aware of the, another person beside you? Yeah. Oh, I had headphones on. I was looking at my phone or, uh, I was I was worrying about this or thinking about I was going to be late for this meeting. Yeah, and so that's situational awareness. Mm-hmm. But again, you know, when I tell people, like, like most people don't walk across the street and get hit by a car, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Because they have situational awareness. Yeah, something in our conditioning has said there's a light, there's a stop sign, there's cars. Yeah. Watch out. Yeah, right. But that doesn't mean that person has self awareness because yeah. while they're walking they're still thinking about work or the mm. fight they had with their with their spouse yeah. or what they need to pick up for dinner. They're not thinking about, you know, where I am. I'm in a, I'm in a danger area. Should I be yeah. should I be, you know, whatever. So there's 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 so many factors, but it comes down to, you know, what I try to do is demystify things and I okay. go, listen, trust your gut, trust your instincts. Every every victim of violence that I've ever talked to yeah. said they had a bad feeling before the attack, but yeah. they didn't know how to extend that radar. So I tell people your intuition, mm-hmm. if you reconnect to it, is like a GPS you have on your phone. Yeah. What happens when I punch in an address on my phone and I drive past the street I'm supposed to turn, the GPS says you're going the wrong way, make a legal U turn. Yeah. And so I tell people that if you get a bad feeling about a business deal, a relationship, uh-huh. a, a, a person, choose safety. That's our mantra, hashtag choose safety. Yeah and address it there's no downside to choosing safety but there is a downside to ignoring that intuitive little fear spike yeah right and so again in talking to every victim of violence when i help them peel the onion they go again he was just there and then he grabbed me or grabbed my purse or started choking me or produced a weapon or whatever i go and you had no pre-contact cue awareness no but when i talk to them they go yeah, I remember getting out of my car and going, wow, it's really creepy here tonight. Like, like that's the fear spike. It's, yeah. It doesn't matter if it seems melodramatic or whatever, Yeah. but you've parked in this underground parking lot for three years. Today it felt creepy. Yeah. And you turn that off and then continued walking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, that's the time where you get back in the car and lock your car. Like, it's just so simple. And, yeah. And if nothing's there... What happened? It became a silly story you told your girlfriend or your buddy. Yeah. Yeah, I got really scared there, so I didn't go outside. Yeah. And I called my, you know, here's a great story. I gave this seminar at, at this gym, and I was talking about improvised weapons. Hey, you can use kettlebells and improvised uh-huh. weapons, but don't use the the forty kilogram one. Use the light one. <laughs> yeah. You know, making jokes and stuff, yeah. and and this and that, and and I get this call like a week after the seminar. Uh huh. And this woman who is a, a co-owner of a facility, she calls me up. She goes, i got to tell you the story because you're going to love it. You'll be proud of me, but it's kind of funny. I'm a little embarrassed. She goes, I'm closing up the gym. It's Friday night. It's 8 o'clock. Uh-huh. I'm closing up, and I notice about 50 yards away in a parking lot because most like of these gyms are like in industrial areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all the cars, it's Friday night, so all the businesses are closed. I, I see the glow of a light of like an iPhone. Uh-huh. Um, uh I see the, the, the glow of a light of this like iPhone. There's somebody sitting in the parking lot mm-hmm. and he's like 50 yards, like, like away. Yeah. And I got this fear spike. Like, what is that? Like, why is it somebody just sitting like for a half an hour in the parking lot? Yeah. 
a near, not in front of my business. Yeah. And I started thinking about it. She said, like, she said, my heart started racing. I got, I got really stressed and I, I locked the doors and I grabbed like a light kettlebell and I had uh-huh. it in my hand. Yeah. I remembered all the stuff you said. And then I remember you saying, don't be embarrassed to call for help. Yeah. You don't have to do this yourself. Mm-hmm. She said, so I called my husband and yeah. I said, there's somebody outside in a car and I'm freaking scared. Yeah. And she paused and she goes, and my husband said, it's me, honey. Remember, I'm picking you up tonight. <laughs> right? And so, but like, but do you understand she chose safety? Imagine yeah. if she just said, I live in a safe neighborhood. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to ignore that. And that's what a lot of people who <laughs> find themselves in scary situations do. They yeah. go, they just, they go, no, it's not happening to me. They go into this denial state or this, yeah. uh, cognitive dissonance yeah no it's okay it's fine yeah that's crazy and that, <laughs> that's that's funny though that's fun i mean i'm glad it worked out well but you're you're so right you know a lot of us nobody wants to believe that the bad thing's gonna happen to them until it happens right. to them until it's too late you know right. that's right. crazy that's and wild so like why i love that story is like like it, you know, it wasn't like oh, Tony selling his program by telling, uh, you know, us like the time that you know, uh, like a, a a seven-year-old kid fought off like ten, you know, uh, bikers. Yeah. Like you know, it's not some bullshit. Yeah. Like what I'm trying, I'm not teaching people how to fight. I'm yeah. teaching them how to not fight. Mm. I'm teaching them how to choose safety. Yeah, I like that. And so, kind of moving up to this last question, I know we're running close on time, right? So, um, you're kind of the only one that I've ever heard that that does what you do, right? The only one in this kind of this realm. So, my question to you is: is why don't more people do what you do? And how did you even take this interest of fear and turn it into what it is now? So, you know, it's interesting, and I and I gotta I gotta uh, uh, call up Coach Connolly and go, hey, like. Help me market this like fear coach. Yeah. Like I've never, because because that's not how I market myself. Yeah. It's not how I, you know. And so a lot of people think I'm just some like knuckle dragging goon who likes fighting. <laughs> and the truth is, I abhor violence, uh-huh. which is why I study it. Yeah. Right. And and I got the amazing honor of working with, you know, good police officers and and good military people trying to keep our cities and our country safe. Yeah. And I do this all over the world, Australia. Yeah. Germany, the UK, uh-huh. you know, whatever. And we, you know, me and my, my company and my, my team, we travel all over the place. Yeah. Um, the, the fear management part was the serendipity where I realized that that became the gateway mm-hmm. to everything. Yeah. That when presented with a new obstacle, if I didn't believe that I had the skills to move towards the danger. Yeah. Then I found ways to sabotage my success or to avoid the the challenge or the conflict. Yeah. Um, and so I had to figure out a way to explain that to myself uh-huh. as an athlete, and then to my students. Yeah. Um, there's a Latin expression, "Qui dos et deset," those who teach learn. Okay. Um, I was very. I mean, students didn't fall on my lap. It wasn't yeah. like I won the lottery. Did you yeah. buy a ticket? No, of course <laughs> not. Like you know, winning the lot, right? Yeah. And so I did. I wasn't sitting there where like like a hundred people walked in and said, "Hey, do you know anyone that specializes in the psychology of fear?" Yeah. What I did was I was very passionate. I really, really cared about my students and their success. Okay. And I was so um, fascinated and and simultaneously fixated. Yeah. On. Well, well, and I didn't have language for this back then. Yeah. There, there wasn't when when I was working on like the neuroscience and metacognition, uh-huh. that language of myelinization, like that wasn't. This is in the eighties. Yeah, we didn't have that language. I didn't know. I was just trusting my intuition. Yeah, you know, and and uh, uh, so all of the, all of the the modern neuroscience that explained what we were doing uh, is is new. It's ten years old. You yeah, know, give or take. So. Um, I just, I just like, if I didn't do well or a student didn't do well, I could have said like, for example, when my student lost his fight in 1980. Yeah. Um. I could have said, well, why didn't you zig when you zagged? Like, mm. why didn't you block this? Why didn't you, you? You were too close. You didn't turn your hip. Yeah. I could have given it a a a uh, uh, a training excuse. Yeah. Oh, your stamina wasn't this, or. Yeah. You know, the distance wasn't really, and that's what people do. You didn't do what I told you. Yeah. And what I did is 
I went, oh my God, I didn't prepare this guy properly. What, yeah. what could I, if I could go back in time, what would I have done to prepare him? Yeah. What would I have done differently? Uh-huh. And, and it was, looking back years later, it was situational awareness, mm. self-awareness, uh, language, de-escalation. Okay. Um, uh, un- understand, understanding the uh, startle flinch in in you know, I didn't give you know, and the details of the, his fight aren't aren't relevant. Yeah. What is relevant for me is that I took ownership over his loss. Okay. Because I didn't, and then and don't confuse that with like a, like a team loses. If you all did everything right, the other team was just better than you. Yeah. In fact, I got a in in a, in a treatise that I wrote years ago. I go, if I'm gonna lose, I want to lose because my opponent was better than me, yeah. not because I was worse worse than he was. Yeah. Um, meaning. If if I just trained to my fifty percent capacity mm-hmm. and potential, and and some hobo shows up at fifty one percent and kicks my ass in a mugging, yeah, like I only have myself to blame. Yeah, yeah. But if I take responsibility for myself uh-huh. and I'm training to the best of my ability, and it's a legit confrontation, I lose. I mean, yeah. Like I can't I can't be better than my best self. Yeah, that's true. You know. Okay. Interesting. Awesome. So last question here. So how can people kind of reach out to you, follow your journey, um, get more information or even take a class? Yeah. Uh, best thing to do is go to our website. It's okay. my last name and the word spear. So my last name is Blauer, mm-hmm. B-L-A-U-E-R. And then the word spear, S-P-E-A-R, Blauer spear, and I'll get to it. Mm-hmm. And I'm on, if they just Google, you know, Tony Blauer, yeah. Blauer spear, you know, they can find out. Yeah. And we've got like, you know, one day courses called Be Your Own Bodyguard, and, okay. and a, lot, a lot of people. This is important to, to comment because anybody who does jujitsu or taekwondo or boxing, yeah, are probably going. Did he just say a one day course? What kind of bullshit <laughs> is this? Um, we do a course. I designed a self defense program uh-huh. in the spirit of a CPR first aid class. Gotcha. So understand this: in a six hour class and a uh-huh. four hour class, you can acquire life saving skills, yeah. CPR and first aid. Yeah. And so, so understand this because it's funny because I've had people in the martial art, uh, MMA, jiu-jitsu world, you know, say that's bullshit. This yeah. is a scam, because what they're in their brain, their mm-hmm. unconscious bias is saying, when they hear a one day self defense course, what they're doing unconsciously is equating it to replacing a martial art. Yeah. You can't learn jiu-jitsu in a day. Yeah. You can't learn to box in a day. You can't learn taekwondo in a day. You yeah. can't learn. Right, but you can learn to detect, diffuse, and defend in a day using a primal gross motor movement pattern. Yeah. Like so, if you can do a push up or you can do a burpee, you can smash somebody in the face. The kinetic chain. Yeah. The core extremity movement. Yeah. Of a of a of a split jerk. Uh-huh. If you do a split jerk. If you do a push up. Yeah. That's the same range of motion kinetic chain required uh-huh. to palm strike someone in the face. Yeah. <laughs> so if I have an athlete that can do push ups. Uh-huh. I can then teach them a nonviolent posture, which yeah. is like it looks like a vertical push up. I just yeah. I go, hey, get in a plank position now, stand up. Yeah. I'll bring your arms in a little bit, right? Uh-huh. And now that position there is the ultimate self defense stance. Uh-huh. It facilitates de escalation and verbal. Yeah. And if the person moves on you, if if you just do a burpee into somebody's face, yeah. it's over. Yeah. Right? yeah. You're gonna turn their head into a Pez dispenser. Now let's not be. <laughs> Now let's not be cavalier about this, folks, because yeah. force must parallel danger. Uh-huh. I'll say that again: force must parallel danger. Mm-hmm. You can't you can't just hit people, yeah. right? Um, and so this is what we teach people: is to understand the law, understand de-escalation, mm-hmm. and we teach this again in this in this one day hit. And if after the after the class you go, man, like I I don't know how to generate power. I don't yeah. know how to you know, generate force or impact. Uh-huh. And like the we tell people, hey, listen. If, because we break it down again, detective use defend. If you understand how to better improve yourself and situational awareness uh-huh. and your verbal skills, you've you have reduced the risk of violence yeah. considerably. Yeah. So the most operative thing people say to me is like, "Hey, I almost got in a confrontation last night, and I remember what you said, and I did that." Like the girl I told you about. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah. She didn't walk outside and find out tonight was a night. Yeah. She did everything right and then found out, wow, that's yeah. my husband sitting there. Because <laughs> yeah. when he pulled up, he got there early. The parking lot was still full. That's yeah. why he was so far away. Yeah, yeah. Like, when the cars left, he didn't bother moving. Yeah. He was on the phone. Naturally, yeah. But great situation where she chose safety and she did the right thing. But when you practice that, uh-huh. 
you cultivate courage and self-awareness because you're practicing those skills. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, um, I, and I just, I guess I hijacked the call and I, and, and I went off on a tangent there <laughs> because, you know, we do have, we've got trainer courses, we've got yeah. ongoing courses, we've got longer courses. Uh -huh. Um, it depends who you are and, and it depends, you know, well, you know what you want to do with it. But yeah. we've got classes for the general public uh -huh. and then we've got classes for professional coaches yeah. and trainers. Awesome. Well, coach, thank you so much for your time. This has been really cool. Um, eye opening and you know, it really makes you think about some things. So once again, thank you so much for this. And, and I know the listener is going to get a lot out of it. Appreciate it, man. I appreciate you having me on and a big shout out to uh, coach Connolly for yes. uh, telling you about me. I agree. I agree. Awesome coach. Well, hopefully we can connect again soon in the future, but until then have a great rest of your day.